Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Hopkins, and today I'm joined by somebody who I've gotten the pleasure to know for a while now, uh, Stephanie Boga. And Stephanie, great to have you on. Uh, excited to go through your story a little bit. I've heard some of it in the past, but uh, I, you know, I think uh, listeners too, uh, we're going to probably learn some new things about you as we go through this too. So really excited to have you on the show. Oh, thanks, Jamie. Happy to be here. So uh, I start off with two icebreaker questions. Uh, the first one's food. So I always ask everyone about food. You know, what is it about food that resonates with you? Would it be your last meal or your favorite type of food? Anything like that? Uh, I am a fan of food in general, all kinds of food uh, in abundance. So uh, things about food. Uh, things that I remember about food are just some really good memories growing up, right? Like I think about you know, we'll talk about this in terms of my story, like, but before my mom got sick, she made like this world's most amazing spaghetti and lasagna. My aunt made this dish called goulash, which is like macaroni and sauce. And she had like her version of it that literally, I think if I were in prison getting my last meal, that might actually be it. Um, so yeah, and then I lived with my grandparents for a while and it was fried everything, right? So if you can give me a plate of fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy, I'm, I'm a pretty happy girl. So have, have you taken on any of those uh, cooking recipes? Can you make the goulash? I have tried for years to make the goulash and it's, it can be good. It can be really, really good. It is never, ever quite the same. So when I go to see that aunt, literally, she makes me big, giant pots of goulash, which is great to be like almost 50 years old and still have someone <laughs> making your favorite food for you. Yeah. That's awesome. And you've obviously traveled a lot too. Do you have a favorite area of food or do you, do you eat somewhat consistent regardless of where you are? Um, I eat all kinds of food all of the time. So if I'm in a region, I obviously really try to eat that food because I'm there and I want to experience it and enjoy it. Um, but like when we, when we travel or when we live in different places, like it's where's the, where's the best Thai food, right? Where's the best Chinese place? Where's that little you know, Mexican dive that just has the best? best tacos. So we're always looking for those places. That's good. And uh, you were splitting time, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the, the pandemic uh, changed your plans a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So we were in Costa Rica full time for seven years. And then our plan this last year, because we go up to Whistler every year for ski season. So our plan this year was to split our time. So we were up there, uh, the plan was to be up there for six weeks and then see if we wanted to extend and then COVID happened in the middle. So we decided to stay and we ended up staying like for three months. And then at some point we were like, oh, we have to, you know, settle somewhere, put our kids in school. At that point, Costa Rica had then closed the border. So we had kind of missed our window to go back. <laughs> Um, and so we ended up in Park City for the ski season, which has been, which has been great. So we'll be here certainly through the school year and then we'll see. But I think, oh, you know, we'll go back and forth because yeah. Costa Rica is kind of magical. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, do you have a favorite food thing in Costa Rica, like cuisine that you've gravitated to since being there? Yeah, the, you know, the honest answer here is there are a lot of amazing things about Costa Rica. I would not say that their cuisine is the thing that they're known for. Um, so no, no. They, yeah, no, no, not really. <laughs> no, nope. now that's it. Fresh no. like fresh pipas or coconuts from the beach, things like that. Like that's just amazing. Like we, fresh mangoes, like thing, you know, that stuff is just really fantastic to have at your fingertips and really get to enjoy. We did definitely eat a lot. Like there's just so much good natural stuff there. Like my kids love fresh coconuts. You know, literally put a straw in them and drink them, and they're yeah. amazing. Yeah. The next kind of intro question I've been asking people and this one is uh new words this the kind of I don't know how many episodes now but we've uh, I started asking people about their first money memory because you know as the, especially in our space advisors love to ask that question to the clients and I'm like I'm going to turn the tables on advisors a lot now and people in our space and just people coming in so first money memory do you have one good bad indifferent what was your first money memory I have some very, very distinct money memories, which are very much related to the fact that I grew up without very much of it. Um, my mother was diagnosed with a mental illness when I was nine. And so just, you know, kind of the next nine years were psychiatric hospitals, panic attacks, pill bottles. My dad had various jobs, but it was just incredibly disruptive to the, to the family dynamic. 
certainly to the family economics. Um, but I remember, and I talk about this a lot with clients, you know, when we especially talk about advice and client experiences, that everybody has this relationship with money. And I'm very, I have very distinct memories of mine. Like my mother kept our money because we didn't have a lot of it in envelopes in a shoebox. And each of those envelopes was labeled groceries, clothes, rent for the trailer, right? Not like that was kind of how we were living. And at the same time, even though she wasn't well and she was in bed and in and out of hospitals, I had these very distinct memories, Jamie, of my father would go to the grocery store. He would come back and it wasn't like he wasn't working hard to keep all of this going. My mother would sit there from the bed, read it and be like, there's the 79 cent error. Like she just had that penchant for knowing. And then he would end up having to go back to the store to get the 70. I remember being a child and thinking, time value of like that can't possibly make any sense. And don't we have something better to do than right itemize the grocery list? But money was a way of control for my mother just based on her situation. And I presume how powerless she felt. I don't know because it wasn't her. And so I, without question, grew up with a scarcity mindset around money. Like you had to once you got it, you had to hold on to it, you had to guard it, you had to protect it, and you had to make really smart decisions about how to use it because you didn't know if the envelope was going to get full again. And so, yeah, that, that radically, I think, framed how I thought about money and my relationship with money, I think, started much more in that survival zone mm -hmm. that I'm always talking about, which is, right, it's this thing I have to have, it's the thing right, that creates security. And when you attach money to security, it has a pretty significant impact on how you work and how you live and how you feel while you're doing it. And as you know, that that's something I had to learn the hard way through what I like to call the science of failure. I learned, the, I learned most of what I know through the science <laughs> of failure. Yeah, I think, it, you know, that's it, it, it's such an interesting thing. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that you could unpack about that or think, try to, but it does resonate with me immediately as of lately about that the whole idea of like bucketing and, you know, mental accounting of money. And really that's, that's more or less a, a version of mental accounting, but actually physically, right. Accounting with envelopes for all of the dollars. Right. And then she went back and rechecked it and made, Hey, look, I mentally put this into this, envelope and it needs to be there and that's a you know i guess everyone does it to an extent right and that was probably a more extreme extent based on circumstances too so yeah interesting um the so obviously that's a formative piece of you growing up right growing up with the scarcity survival um you know your mom's mental illness and that obviously shapes a lot of things so when was your like first job so you were what nine years old when your mom really got sick or was diagnosed and then you know wh wh when did you start working because i imagine you probably had to at a necessity at some point right uh, I, yes, I did. Certainly. I mean, right. I, it, when I was older, I got a job at Carl's Jr. and Little Caesars Pizza and I can, right. I can, I learned very quickly that that's not what I wanted to do as a career. Um, so if nothing else, I'm a quick learner, but my first working memories of money in terms of like actually working for it myself were honestly necessitated by our circumstance. So when my, when my mother got to a place where she was, you know, more stable, we'll call it, I would not say that that was a constant, but she could, she was in a place where she would go through periods where she'd be more stable. And our situation financially was not particularly awesome. We lived literally in a trailer park. Uh, it was a fancy trailer park. Like, it, you know, they were the, the, the pre, they didn't have wheels on the bottom, right? So we were classy with the K, as I like to joke. Um, but we would go through periods where there was no money in the envelopes. And we literally, I remember my parents having just awful, horrific fights around finances and all that dynamic. And then you had mental illness and right, just not a fun place, but we would literally end up and it, look, I have an amazing work ethic as a result, but my mother, you know, would go around and knock on doors and we would clean other people's mobile homes. Like literally it would be me and her and the buckets and the Windex. And I have, man, the memories, I have a memory of this one trailer that I cleaned. I was talking about it on social media at one point of uh, literally I took the pictures and I might have been 12, 13 at this point, taking the picture off of the wall and the nicotine.
15 was so thick, like that, that, that wall mm -hmm. had never been cleaned in the 15 or 20 years that the person had been living in it. And I was like there with bucket and sponge, literally scrubbing nicotine off walls and toilets, you know, all the other stuff. Um, and that was how my relationship with work started. It was one of necessity and it wasn't glorious. Uh, some, you know, I learned a lot of very good things that have served me well later, but that, that is literally when I first started and I babysat a ton that's in Girl Scout cookies, which by the way, is a lot funner than cleaning nicotine off trailer walls. <laughs> if you have to choose, babysitting is a way better option. Do you remember your first probably like purchase that was for yourself? Cause I would imagine, right. It, it, that yep. the money that you were earning early on wasn't really going to you. It was going to right food yep. housing shared services right for the family yep i do remember the thing i moved out when i was 17 uh again <laughs> whole separate story in conversation but and this is a this is a life lessons learned which are very valuable but i got a job as a receptionist in an insurance office and I remember getting like my first or second paycheck and I was living with my, an aunt at the time. And I remember thinking, oh, this is great money. So I went out and spent money. And I went to the jewelry store in the mall and I bought myself, I'll never forget, a little sapphire and gold ring that I thought was the coolest thing ever. And then I proceeded to keep enjoying it. And then getting these bills from the credit card that I didn't really understand. And then I started getting calls from collection agencies. I think I'm at my We've got to be like 19 or something at this point. And literally at one point I had $8,000 in debt and I was literally about to get, I had gotten engaged and I was like, this is mine. I'm going to take care of it. And, you know, that was really kind of the first purchase was that ring. And it taught me an incredibly valuable lesson. Cause I think like a lot of people, I didn't have, particularly given my situation, I had no financial literacy in terms of how money worked and, you know, credit cards, much less how to, you know, save it. Like I had, to, again, I had to learn those things like most people do right through life. Did, did you, uh, do you remember, where did you get the credit card? Was it at one of the stores? Was it like a store one or did you like apply for one somewhere? I want to say it was a jewelry store credit card and I'm quite certain I got something in the mail that said, hey, wouldn't you like, and I, the first, I want to say it was like 500 or a thousand dollars. And I think then the jewelry store was on top of that. And, you know, this concept of balancing your checkbook was just not a, anything I, remember, I grew up with envelopes, except that I wasn't using the envelopes and I wasn't using yeah. a checkbook, which is a little <laughs> bit of a problem, right? <laughs> Reconciling your inflow and your outflow is obviously a concept I've come to learn. Yeah, um, I was like, you didn't yeah. keep the system. The system was there for a reason, Stephanie. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to be like 80. I'm going to have my shoe box I'm carrying around. Yeah. It, do you well, now you know why I'm a fan of bucketing strategies, right? Because yeah. my, my, my money mind is sort of wired to right, compartmentalize money relative to a specific purpose. So look at that in a right envelope, one envelope. And there's, right, we've done this in other firms. Like that's, why these conversations are so important and how do we turn that intangible relationship and feelings about our money into a tangible, I'm going to say this in air quotes, if you're listening, controllable experience, it's not controllable, it's human, but the process itself, we can standardize and systematize so that we can really specialize on the value piece, which is giving advice about the facts and what people's relationship with those facts is. And, you know, I'm very clear because of the work that I do that that is my relationship with money. And I've had to really reframe my relationship with money. And I think that's a core piece of the value proposition that advisors add that they're not always tuned into or, or training themselves on or tapping their skill set on fully enough in terms of the value that they can really add as the trusted advisor. What do you think, uh, maybe a, a you know, a money style bias, a behavioral bias that you have around money that you still need to work on? Like, is there anything that's like top of mind that you're like, you know, I'm not that great with this around money that, you know, I try to get better at it or? You know, that's a great one. I think for anyone that started their relationship with money from a place of survival, I think it's something that you will probably always manage. The reframe that I use, and I use it regularly, is 
money isn't right. It's not, it's not a thing in a shoebox that I can run out of. And this is just my perspective from right business strategy and coaching and my own life experiences is money is really nothing more than consciousness turning your attention into form, right? When you think about every time that you've ever really made money, Jamie, it was because you had an idea that you paid attention to. And when you get distracted from that idea, that objective or that goal, life happens, the email comes in, the markets go up and down, your boss wants X, Y, or, you know, whatever it is, we end up, I call it running the shop. We run the shop. And it's not that there's not value in that, but that's not generally what brings the more and the better. It's not what advances organization. It's not what most leaders like to do. So part of our job, I think, is how do we create that headspace so that we are aware? And for me, I just had to really frame when I would find myself, because what it's really about, our relationship with money, is really about our relationship with fear and control. Because for most people, not everyone, but for the vast majority of people, money represents some form of security. And when we think about having money and not having money, like when I talk to our advisors as clients, I say to them, what would you do if you already had it? Well, I'm afraid to pick an edge or I'm afraid of this or I don't want to deal with the staff issue or, and I'm like, well, what if you already had it? What if you already had a million dollar practice with hundred days off and you worked with clients that you love and you didn't need that next dollar? Would that influence the way that you made the decision? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, well, that's why you're stuck. Because there's that compromise cost and it's driven by fear. And we look at money as this sort of tangible. And I just look, I, I had to reframe my relationship with it. It's just a tool. It's a lever that I pull in a way that serves me. But the real value, the thing I want to protect is my ability to form an idea and own my attention. Because to me, that's what money is. It's my attention in form, like it's energy that my attention, yeah, right? When you focus on something, that idea turns into energy. And if you execute well, it turns into money. And so the more we focus in and live and work from that space, my experience is the happier we are, the more successful we are, far more leverage that we get. And our job is to spend less time in that zone. And you spend a lot of time consulting and working with advisors and coaching advisors too. And do you have an advisor yourself now? Do you use an advisor for your finances? Yes. Had one for a very, very long time. How'd you, how'd you pick that person or how did they pick you? <laughs> I would, well, at the time, I, I mean, I was, it was, I was much younger in my career and they worked with my higher net worth people, but I was coaching them. So they were kind, they were kind <laughs> enough to take me on. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. And and have you found like so? How does that shape your view of money or your finances too? Like, in, in what kind of I guess mental capacity does that ease something for you? You know, I think it's a great question. Here's how I would answer that. I'm sure I'll think, oh, I could have come up with something better later. Truly, I think we have kind of three relationships with money. One, if you like, if you take a page and you divide it into sections, right? You draw a line across the middle. That line is, you know, if we're looking at our brains and neuroscience and performance, it's homeostasis, right? We're calm. Our brains aren't on high alert. They're not, right? They're just sort of calm and cool and in the middle. When we think about money, we have an above the line relationship with money. We feel empowered. We feel like we can do great things with it. When we have a below the line relationship with money, we feel disempowered, we feel fearful and uncertain and anxious, right? All the anxiety and stress that we feel. If we understand that like most of us will lean into one, one of those three zones, some people's first and foremost approach to money is fear-based, right? That's below the line. It's scarcity, it's that, you know, the person that's never bought a new car, right? And you, you, you all know this, right? You, you, you know those profiles. The above the line person, think about your entrepreneur, your business owner, like they're like, let's go, let's take money out, let's do this, I don't mind the risk. Right? They have a very, very different relationship with fear and risk and control than the person at the bottom of that scope. And then if we're honest, you've got people who are in the middle and they do this constantly. And those are the, like you, you have a, in my view, a different style of kind of behavioral coaching with clients based on where they are because you have your core story and value proposition, you have your approach, and they're always dancing around that. And your job is to help them navigate the highs, the lows, and that middle ground, bringing, bringing them back to your approach, which is how you deliver on right their goals and their outcome. 
And that's part art and part science, as you know, right? Some of it you can plan and process and predict, and the rest of it you are bobbing and weaving all the time. Well, I think we got half an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So we're going to push back. So, so yeah. where does that, so where does that put you in relation to the advisor? Like, do they help get you to more of a level place with it? Or do you think they help you spend, you know, where, where are they taking you on that? Oh, my advice. Oh, they are super good at helping me stay above the line. So you all have had conversations and this was a, a number, a number of years ago, but I remember when we first sat down and did all our planning and we'd sold the, you know, I'd sold my business. And so, you know, that's a great, love those meetings. Those are great meetings. And, you know, here's the plan, you know, you all know this, here's the plan, here's the recommendation. And of course I was early in my coaching career and I certainly hadn't done the executive and the personal work. And so I was like looking at every page of the cash flow, like what is line 73 on page, whatever. I mean, I like my brain was so looking for the thing that was going to bite me in the hiney later that these people might be missing. They, of course, had an answer for everything, but they were wise because at one point they said, okay, Steph, what is it that you're afraid of? They asked me, I don't remember the exact question, but it was, I grew up with a box and envelopes and money. And my husband had a very different experience with money. And so we, right, they asked some great questions and they got to, what are you really afraid of? And I'm like, I don't want to ever be in a situation where I'm fighting about whether the rent on the trailer is going to get paid. And I have to worry about my kids worrying about, Ooh, see, it just, it affects me. Like, I don't ever want my kids to worry about if they're going to be kicked out of their classy with a K tray. Like, I don't know. Emotionally, it does not matter what you tell me as an advisor. If you do not assuage that need, my brain cannot hear you they were good at what they did and they asked questions like, what are you really afraid of? And I was like, soup line. Okay, great questions. Hey, Stephanie, Great Depression, what was the unemployment rate? I don't know, about 20, 25%. Okay, who do you think the 25% that were unemployed were? Were they like the best and the brightest? Were they, you know, and I was like, I don't know. Like, okay, would you put yourself in the 25% or the 75% if something <laughs> were to happen? And I was like, oh, I would totally be in the 75%. I might be selling, or I said this, I swear to you out loud, I might be selling oranges on the street corner, but I will be selling those oranges <laughs> better than anybody because <laughs> I will have my babies to feed. And yeah. so we really got to this place where we ended up with, okay, worst case scenario is how long would it take you to get off the street corner and back on your feet? It's like, worst scenario, it was like, give me two years, I can do anything. Okay, so... Why don't we take two years of cash, put it over here in this very safe place so that as you're making the decisions about what to do with this capital, what to start another business, take a year off, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And man, you want to talk about freedom? Like that's what you all do. That's what I do as a coach. That's what you do as advisors is you're giving people permission to work through the stuff they really need to work through to get to the mental space. Maybe it's not financial freedom for everybody, but comfort and peace of mind and confidence. Like those are the feelings that people want from their finances. And so uh, you brought this up too, which I think is a great question. I spend more time thinking about this that I mean, probably every week is more than it's been the previous week is like, what is what are my kids experience with money going to be? And what lessons, so what have you started to teach to your kids about money? Uh, as much as humanly possible. And I think, you know, if you understand that we have that relationship and those relationships become the stories in the script that fuel us going forward, right? The market going down isn't the reason that the client's calling. You've told them that it will happen. It's because the story that their brain is telling them in that moment is more powerful than the stories you've told them to that point. If you know that, then you know that your first and foremost job is to get really good at creating and telling and reinforcing stories, not showing you know, plans and, and again, not that that stuff's not important. So I think for me, um, I, got, I went off on a tangent. I lost, I forgot the question. Remind well, me. Well, I was gonna say- yeah, so I get I, excited about stuff yeah. sometimes. So you're taking that as, as, as what you're now teaching your kids about stories, right? Yes. About money. Yeah. yeah. So the stories <laughs> around money is when, when, you, when you struggle as a child, you have a very different experience than when you don't. And the honest truth is my children haven't struggled in the way that I did. And they're not overly spoiled. They don't have rooms filled with stuff. But at one point, my husband and I sat down and said, how do we instill work ethic? 
How do we instill a positive relationship with money? And, you know, we realized, hey, we need to give, you know, chores are really valuable, right? Earning things as opposed to being given things. Um, and that was, that's really something that we've, you know, they, and we have, and this is, this is very popular on Pinterest or other things, but like, you know, give, save, spend jar. Mm -hmm. So my son was just asking me what to do with his hundred dollars. And I was like, what goes in the give, what goes in the save, what goes in the spend? And he was like, okay, I want to give, I want to save $20. I want to invest that in Bitcoin. He's really big on Bitcoin right now. I want to, you know, I'll save, I'll give $20 to, you know, to people that need it. And then the rest I'm going to spend on my video games. And I was like, Okay, whether I agree with what you're doing with the, this is not really the point here. The life lesson is, right, that there's a thought process they want you to go through that includes not just make more, keep more, hold on, survive. Like I want him to have, and I want my daughter to have a much more expansive relationship. To, and to me, that's educating through conversation, but truly it's through life experiences. Like he came to me and he said, I've got this money. Can I invest in Bitcoin? This is right about the time that Bitcoin put themselves on PayPal. And I was like, okay, let's have the conversation, right? High return equals high risk. Like this, this is not an all up game. So we were, and he was like, okay. And I thought, you know, my husband, and I talked, he's going to learn valuable things either way. The fact that he's interested in money and that he's trying to understand it and figure out how to navigate it is something that I want to foster. And so we've, we've also done... Right. So we've, you know, trying to teach good thought process, trying to teach good habits, and then trying to give them the opportunity to have some experiences, even if, you know, they might not, I think it'll pan out fine in the long term. I think he's, you know, we're going to, I'm on the roller coaster of wisdom, but I think it'll be fine in the end. <laughs> well, let's go back to your, I guess, so you, your first job, and then when did you start your first business? So that's always an important part too, right? So you did not stay as, uh, what were you, the, the intro person, the director no, of first I, impressions? What, what did you start with? What was the first oh, job? Uh, my first job in the space was as a receptionist in yeah. an insurance office, and then uh, very, very fancy formal background, went off to junior college. Remember, I moved out on my own, so just a different story. Um, and I got my legal secretary certificate because I had been re really grooming myself to be a lawyer. Got that, uh, you know, 20 years old, got a job in a big international law firm, worked my way up downtown, and then ultimately ended up in uh, taking a job. They were, they were, uh, they were promoting on, online. It was like for an office manager. And I went in and there were three people in the office. And I was like, there's three people here. I don't think there's a lot to manage. I'm good at marketing. How about we do that? And so that was really my first foray into this space was really that estate planning wealth management firm, which was a great place to kind of cut your teeth and learn about the, all the different aspects of wealth management. And we worked in the, you know, kind of higher net worth and upper net worth space, which was also a great experience. So you, th that job, you kind of created your own job as you walked in, huh? <laughs> Yeah. And in hindsight, it seems so ludicrous, doesn't it? Here I am like 20 years old, but the firm that I was in, in, in this large international firm, I had had this, I was working with a rainmaker. So I'd moved up very quickly and gotten put on a rain. And that's just a great experience to have. And he said something to me that I've never forgotten. And uh, his name was Jonathan Bank. And he looked at me and he said, Stephanie, and I think I might've been 19, literally or 20 at the time. And he said, Stephanie, there are two sides to any business. There's the money going inside and the money going outside. If you want to make any real money in this life, make sure that you are on the money going inside. And I don't know why, but that's like, that really stuck <laughs> with me. Um, and so when I went into that firm, I was like, there's literally nothing here to manage. And I had been very observant of him and marketing. And honestly, I think it's just something that kind of clicks with my brain. And that's literally how I got started. And I was, I think I was there for a couple of years. And then at 24, I think to go back to your actual question, I was 24 when I actually started my first firm, which was Quantibus Consulting. Yep. And so, which is also ludicrous <laughs> in, in theory. Well, you know, you, when you're ready, you're ready, right? That I, I think that's always uh, that's a big thing. I mean, I run into people say, "Oh, I'm not ready to go start my own business now." Maybe emotionally, they're not ready, right? But 
I, a lot of times I don't think there's a better time. Like there's not going to be a perfect time that's going to come around <laughs> later no, on. I, and I totally agree with you. I truly, I'm on the other side of that spectrum. I just didn't have the common sense. And I'm not saying that I would agree with it to this day. I would say you should not have common sense. Otherwise yeah. you'll get very common <laughs> results. I'm, I'm not in the business of common. But what I didn't, you, what the backstory there is I was married. My husband and I had both been going to school part-time. I was making great money doing what I was doing. So I was like, you go full time, you finish, then I'll, then I'll go. We had just bought a house. So I had quit my job at 24, started a consulting firm, uh, told my husband to quit school. We were paying tuition cash and I had this mortgage payment and I literally took $5,000 and bought, I call it the paper mache desk from Home Depot. You know, the kind, if you leave the water glass on too long, it literally bubbles up. Bubbles up yeah. And like, it didn't occur to me. Oh, you could, you know, you're, you, what if you can't pay tuition? How are you going to pay? Like, I was just so blindly like, hey, this is a good idea. I don't like commuting. That was really the impetus for it. And people were asking. And that you know, when I look at that, like the risk factor to your point around the early, you know, the risk factor was not present in my mind, which is funny because that's not uncommon. If you think about founders and entrepreneurs, when we're young and we have very little to lose, we're all in. And then we get successful. And then suddenly taking that risk feels terrifying. And young you would have been like, holy heck, what are you doing? And it's because it's what I call fear of falling. Yep. Now your brain is like, let's take that scarcity mentality that you weren't really guarding anything. You were in open territory. Well, now you've got a seven figure business and a brand and kids and private school tuition. Like now, now we have to play it safe. And that playing it safe for me and my career and for so many of my clients is the thing that holds us back from from really creating the more and better that calls to so many of us. And that's really, for me, we're retiring and going off and really learning about mindset and the power of that was really just the game changer for me. And in terms of being able to really overcome that and lean into the next chapter of my life, when I unretired Jamie, I literally said out loud, I'm going to do this with no fear. Whatever. They can come, they cannot come. It'll be what it'll be, but I want to show up as authentically as I possibly can, talk about areas that are important where I think I can have impact, and we'll see what happens. And that, I think, is a conscious choice as business leaders that we have to remind ourselves to make. So, yeah, I love that. I mean, it, and it's true that that fear of falling, right? And I go back and I think about those things, too, when you're young, at least from the financial side, right? The taking risk, right? If you go back though, like, yes, you could have lost the house, but the, the, all the way to zero isn't all that far yet. Right. Like, <laughs> it's a, like it's a bruised knee. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, you know, a hundred percent down when you have like a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars when you then, you know, accumulate a business and a bunch of people work for you and rely on you, it becomes very different because then a hundred percent down is a lot of pain for a lot of people. Yep. And I think that's a, it's an interesting point. So you build up the consulting firm and I always like, I, we've talked about this once before, right. But, you know, selling the firm and, and moving into like corporate America again, like what, what was that experience? Right. Like, because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't forever for you. <laughs> uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a growth experience. That's what we're going to call it. It was a great, it, I, I joke about this, but it's absolutely true. I learned a ton of things, none of the things that I expected to learn, yeah. truly. Like you go in when you, any, you know, I did a lot of M&A work before that. So I was really honestly quite prepared, not for, in the economics or pretty, but I was pretty prepared, the control issue, right? Having a ball, you know, I, I was pretty prepared for that. Being prepared for that and then having ideas that you can't execute on in the way that you want to execute on them, I think, you know, you're flexible, but I think we all also ultimately have to understand the kind of environment that we exceed in best. And it was a great experience, truly being on the executive team, Fortune 200 company, like the things that I was exposed to have been phenomenally valuable. I would not take it back. And I learned about myself that I'm not a run the shop gal. I'm good at run, I'm great at setting the standard and getting an organization there. I love leading into the possibility, like that's absolutely my jam, but running the shop, and many founders understand this, 
that makes me want to put a pencil in my ear. So when my leadership position, however prominent and all of that it is, when I'm on my 27th version of a PowerPoint deck, literally that's barely indecipherable from the original version, because we have a quarterly meeting, I was like, hmm, you know, I'm a mountain climber and this is not a mountain and you got some great people here and I'm gonna go not do anything for a while and figure out what I wanna do. And so it was a phenomenal experience, but I truly had to learn about myself that I'm an idea person that executes on those ideas. And so I ultimately need to be in a position where I'm able to do that. And I know you told that story uh, right now, and it kind of almost sounded like an example, but that was what happened, right? With the wasn't it the PowerPoint, and it was like the twenty seventh version. Oh, I'm not. And I'm you were like, like I'm, that's no, it, no right? disrespect to yeah. anyone. I'm not <laughs> like that. CEO was a great, a really good person and a good CEO. We just had a very different style, and 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 I also, in hindsight, understand a lot more than I did in it. Which is why I know of myself that public companies are probably not my jam because I'm a possibility. Like I literally refer to myself as the chief possibility officer. My job is to look ahead, see what's possible, take stock of everything and figure out the fastest, best, most enjoyable way. That's the new part to get there. And so the idea of, well, you know, we, these are the quarterly numbers and it's this, and we don't need to rock the boat. We just, like iterations of things is not the best use of my time and energy in terms of influence and impact. And so that was, that was what it was. So then you write, quote unquote, retired, you left, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and we'll put that in quotes too, because you want to retire, right? It's a, uh, you know, it's one, one whenever uh, was it paid in Manning or Brett Favre kept almost retiring for like <laughs> 10 years and then they were just back and, <laughs> So you're you're too young to retire. So yeah. you you uh, took the year off, right? And that's where you got the kind of the mindset, uh, kind of mentality piece, a little bit more solidified, I guess. Yeah, I was I was officially like I did no work officially. I think it was three or three and a half years. Mm -hmm. I literally, when I unretired, I had nothing on my agenda, and I had one goal: to have nothing on my agenda and get very intentional about what I put back onto it. Like I wanted, to, I wanted it because again, it, it, if you've heard my story, but for me going to Costa Rica was, was not so much walking away from something. I just knew that whatever I had been striving for wasn't on the path that I was on. I needed to disrupt that in some way, shape or form. And just, I had young kids at the time and right. It just, the timing and everything worked out. And so for me, it was really about no longer success wasn't now it wasn't going to be about striving for significance that's what i learned when i went away is all that striving and the need to be perfect and build a super excellent business which is a great reputation to have but you also want to balance that with living a happy and satisfying life right one can't drive to the exclusion of the other which is very common in the founders right or the if you own a practice you're leading a large organization is what we all ultimately want is the ability to have what I call high performance happiness. We want the ability to be, if I'm being really blunt, like super badass at what we do and know that it's all working so that we can go home and fly our planes or hang out with our kids or run the PTA or golf or whatever it is without it being all consuming. And that is absolutely methods. But what I learned when I went away, and this was the thing that, you know, like blew my mind. I read a Carnegie Institute study from 1906. It said the three factors to success are environment, skills, and mindset. Okay, that makes sense. What really blew my mind was that mindset was greater than 80% in terms of the contributing factor. And I thought, holy heck, this stuff that I've been struggling with is all happening between my ears and I didn't even know it. And by the way, it all happened without my knowledge or consent. I had like a Scooby-Doo moment. I was like, what? Okay, that means that I can then own my mind, elevate my thinking and create a different experience for myself. And that's literally what I spent the next 
I mean, I still do it now, right? For, but literally for the next three years, that was my full-time occupation. I was like copiously studying. And I don't mean like reading the self-help books and the platitudes. I'd read all of those. Reading them, you can rub them on your forehead. It's not going to work. <laughs> you have to apply the knowledge. And so I like the boring, you know, the 90 page research paper, like, oh, this is how my brain's really working. And when you learn that, you really do have the capacity to own your mind, elevate your thinking. And people always ask me, like in coaching, how am I getting these hockey stick results with people? And I was like, look, if you do the work and here's the work, get clear, get focused, then get to work. We do, we do take the time. They're like I was doing all that work. Like I didn't even know why I was doing it. Right. We don't, weren't clear on what we want to build in an organization. We're not clear on our strategy. We're not clear on what, you know, I mean, we could have that conversation about methods and leadership all day long, but our mindset is ultimately what allows us to pull the trigger. When we get to the top of the mountain and we see the next mountain, there's this crisis of confidence that kicks in, right? The hesitation, the fear, the, you know, to your point, I've got 10 people. I've got to employ, I've got clients that if I change my fees, my clients will all leave me, I'll get eaten by a hungry tiger and I'll die. Right? Like I know how it feels and our job is to overcome that, right? For me as a coach, it's to help you do that. For you as an advisor, it's to coach your client through that process in whatever way you choose to do it. Well, I think this is a interesting PSV of now that you're working with a lot of advisors on coaching, and I mean, I know you've been in coaching space for a long time. What do you think it is that where somebody is actually ready to be coached? Because there's actually still a lot of people that, you know, aren't quite ready, right? And it, it comes down to that, uh, maybe some of that willingness to kind of open up and do some of the work or to take some risk, because if they're not there, I mean, every coaching firm in the history of the world knows this, right? You get some that just don't do the work and don't move forward. And so what is it that you think is kind of one of those measurements for when is somebody ready to actually get the most out of a coaching consulting style relationship out there? I could give you a really coachy researchy answer, but the honest answer truly is someone is ready when their why is bigger than their what ifs. And, you know, you, I think you've heard me tell the story about the lollipop. And I think the challenge for most of us is because, not because of our intention, not because of our desire, which is what creates all the congruence and the frustration, because everyone listening to this has some piece of like, oh, I know I'm really trying to break through that. And we think it's a strategy, right? I have to hire a different person or I have to have a different service model. I have to change a fee. And strategy is super important. Like those methods count. But it's the thought process that we're bringing to it that creates the clarity that we need to make the decisions that are most aligned with our goals. And when we lose that through that crisis of confidence because of what we're worried about is happening, then, then that's what ultimately shuts us down. So looking into the future, what do you want your next big impact legacy to be? So that's, uh, that's kind of we, we go through the, some of the story and then what's that impact and legacy that you want to look back and say, I did accomplish all those things I just went over. And, and I like the other one too, like right? getting there in the most efficient way, but also like the most enjoyable way. That's, that's new. <laughs> so, uh, that's good. I, I don't usually think about things in that way. I'm just still thinking, you know, if, you know, when I build stuff, I don't think about what's the most enjoyable way to build it. I'm still just like, and I'm literally thinking about stuff I built on the house. If it's still the fastest and best way to do it, it might not be the most enjoyable, but that's it. I like that piece. <laughs> well, I think that's part of the frame that we each, you know, we bring to it, which is if we look at what you do in a day or what an advisor does in a day, a lot of it isn't what I'll call that energy creating revenue producing activity. But to your point, like we have this idea that high performance and happiness are somehow mutually exclusive. And what I ultimately learned is when you get your mindset and your methods right on the business side, and you're very clear in your intention in terms of like, when are people ready? They're ready when they're just tired enough to raise the bar, either because the pain point or the pressure is just suffocating and they're stuck and they're stalled and they're like, this is ridiculous, right? I, I know there's a better way. 
or when they see the possibility, which is why you and I, right, we're always talking about the work we do of a new normal. When, when they see the success results that we've gotten or that you guys have gotten and they go, oh, wait, you know, you can make this change, whether it's a niche or a service model or hiring a professional manager or whatever, emanate, like when you see that there's, that you are leading, our brains have this tendency to focus on the problems, not the possibilities. And really it's about how do we shift our headspace so that we lean first into the possibility. Yes, we want to make good business decisions, but how do we shift it so that Fear is our fuel, not our fertilizer, right? That yes, it's there for a reason and there are voices in our head, but they're not usually our friend and they're often the loudest. And so when someone gets to the point where they are simply ready to raise the bar, I talked about the lollipop of mediocrity. The reason I call it the lollipop of mediocrity, and this is not, as you know, the most eloquent thing I've ever said, is because when you take one lick from the lollipop of mediocrity, if you are not careful, you will suck forever. Because it's sweet, and it's easy, and it's tasty. And that's, you know, I'll take that phone call, I'll check my email 17 times, I'll take a client that doesn't fit. Instead of being able to disrupt the pattern and be able to be dis uncomfortable enough over and over to get to the place where I have the practice and the life that I want. And when someone's there and they get the right headspace, moving the needle and pulling the levers at a business level is, you know, like that's just the work. If you can get clear and get focused, if the why gets bigger than the what if, then you'll create the change. Uh, I'm gonna ask one more question, a little bit of a side deviation, but it kind of, it, uh, the reason why it popped in my head but um how do you think our industry especially financial services advisors how do we get better on you know being more inclusive to just different types of people right so women in leadership roles right black americans in leadership roles and advisory roles because you have been more vocal on that probably than you were, especially now that you're, you're on Twitter now where you weren't before. So now you get to join <laughs> with all the FinTwit people. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have really fun conversations on there for sure. Yeah. And yeah. so, so what do you think we need to do there? I know that's not what you're here to solve for today, but I mean, I think as an industry, we're all part of it, right? So. Well, but I think the truth is, and you asked the question before, like the, the answer to the last question, the answer to this one is very much the same, which is my mission. If I Right, my reason for unretiring was to truly teach people that success can be satisfying. Like, if you distill it all the way down, it's that you can have a wildly successful practice or business and a life that you love. Right? Here's what I've learned about how to do that, but that's the core mission. When you think about when I talk about this concept of high performance happiness, the reason that it's important is because here's what I know you cannot give what you do not have. And when we get squeezed, what's inside comes out, right? So when the markets go down and a client calls, it's right, they got squeezed and the fear came out. And the reason that we have those issues is not because everybody on the planet, this is my personal view, please don't send me hate mail, is not because everybody's a bad person. I see guys make mistakes online all the time that I know they're good people and they don't intend to make. I just know it. But what I also understand is at the end of the day, our brains work a certain way. Like we are truly, ladies and gentlemen, by the time that we are 35, we are 95% a set of conditioned programmed behaviors. Literally on a daily basis, you are consciously thinking about 5% of the time, truly. Our responses are, I'll take the client, I won't, I'll say yes to like, it's all so habitual. And when we sit down and have coaching conversations, you, right, you can cut through that, rethink things and start to shift it. So one is it's about really educating people on what raising the bar, like what's an appropriate standard. But to your point, if people have high performance happiness, if they don't feel like they live in survival mode, if I feel like I've got a good practice and I'm working with clients that I like and I have a great income and I'm taking time off, I'm not going to be in that survival or that stress state as much. I'm going to be more open and more expansive. And I think if we can create businesses and leadership where both the, right, the founders and the employees, all the stakeholders, the clients can all ultimately win, then that's conscious capitalism. And if you have that, then we don't have as much lack. And all of the things that you've described, 
all of the fears that clients call with, all of my fears around money, they all come from a place of lack, right? From that below the line place. And so if we can each ask ourselves, how am I showing up in this space? Am I, right? am I not just being silent and not making mistakes? Am I being supportive? Am I advocating for women and diversity and right, people who don't have as much voice in the space? And then try and create a new standard across the profession. But it starts with not feeling like someone else's success somehow means I'm sacrificing something personally. And when you look at people, you can sort of generally tell where they are above the line, at the line, or below the line, like we talked about, on any particular issue based on how they show up in their vocabulary. And if you know that, it puts you in a better space to know how to address them. If you're talking with a peer who's below the line around you know, females in the workplace or diversity, you might approach that conversation differently than someone that's a staunch advocate. And I think just awareness of that across the profession, right? Males and females in more conversation is helpful. Well, this was a fantastic conversation. I said, my only job is to <laughs> drive along and keep us on time. So we're right there. All right. Uh, <laughs> it's an easy job. So uh, you did all the great work here today as you have been. Uh, keep working uh, out there helping, you know, to, to move this whole profession forward and create success, new mindset, and, you know, better practices, more efficient, high performance, all of that. I love it. Uh, so best places to find you. That's always a, a good way to close. Uh, uh, Websites, uh, uh, social media. I'm obviously on Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, you can also join our uh, monthly Mojo newsletter at limitlessfa.life. Uh, and you can stay tuned on everything that we're doing there. Awesome. Well, Stephanie, always great to see you. Hopefully I'll see you in person later this year yes, too. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, it's always great talking to you. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. And thanks everyone. Bye, thanks everyone for listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast.